And so I, the title of my, of my talk is, is forest management for marine species, Tom's tines and tanagers. And I uh, did that for the nice alliteration there with the three T's, but also to try to build the case and make the case that uh, while we may focus management a lot of times on game species like toms, turkeys, or, or deer, we can do that in a way that we can actually benefit a lot of non-game species like the summer tanager in the pictures there. So certainly tanagers aren't a game species, but I'm gonna to try to build the case for you that through management for game species, we can also benefit a whole suite of non-game species. And so I saw um, some of the previous topics for webinars and I saw that Dr. Adam Jenke over at uh, your neighbor to the west at Iowa State gave a presentation kind of broadly about forest management for wildlife. Um, and him and I collaborate on a lot of stuff together. And so my talk will be really a continuation of his talk and thinking about um, how we can kind of focus some of the, the concepts and things that um, Adam talked about and focus them on for a variety of game species. So, uh, Things that we're going to cover in the talk today, um, we're going to talk about some common game species, particularly within kind of Illinois, the central hardwoods region, even up into the upper Midwest, um, what some of their habitat requirements are, and then how forest structure and wildlife habit habitat quality are related. Um, so we're going to cover off on a variety of habitat and forest management practices and how we can kind of gear those towards our wildlife objectives um, as well as uh, as for the game species we're interested in and gear them towards non-game species and then talk kind of broadly about how we can use forest management as a whole to achieve our wildlife objectives so the kind of central uh, thesis to this presentation or question of this presentation is can we achieve our game species management goals while still providing habitat for non-game species if we think about um, the number of game versus non-game species we have. If you look kind of broadly at wildlife across the United States, only about 10% of the wildlife species, the vertebrate wildlife species that we have are considered game species. The other 90% are non-game species. So there's lots and lots of other critters out there in the woods um, that are not species that we hunt or, or have, trap or have a season for. So I think it's important as as managers and landowners that we not only think about um, the species that are of particular interest in this case game species, but also think about what are the consequences of our management actions for non game species and can we achieve can we also can we benefit game species and non game species alike. And so I think about this in the in the concept of what's called an umbrella species and the idea is that by managing for one focal species or uh, one species of interest, in this case, white-tailed deer, you could take the white-tailed deer out and you could put in northern bobwhite in there as well. Um, through the management and focus on that one species, we can actually benefit a suite of species that share similar or overlapping habitat requirements. And so by managing forests for deer through practices that we're going to talk about later, such as timber harvest or prescribed fire or opening up the canopy through forest and improvement. We can actually provide habitat for a, a variety of wildlife species. Um, and I just threw a few under there, things like turkeys, tanagers, redheaded woodpeckers, grouse, uh, owls and bats are all species that would benefit from a variety of different management practices. And now it's certain uh, that if you do management for a species like deer, it's not going to benefit all species, all wildlife species, because they have such a broad habitat requirements. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but there are certain species that will benefit from from that management. That, that, that's that concept of umbrella species. So the kind of uh, forest game species that we're going to kind of hit on and, and talk about are mainly the top four there, white-tailed deer, eastern wild turkey, American woodcock, and, and ruffed grouse. And um, I saw some folks some from Pennsylvania and Wisconsin on the call. Uh, you all are having a much better time with your grouse than we are here in Indiana. Um, 
and I did some looking in Illinois and I don't, I know there were some reintroduction, grouse reintroduction projects down in the Shawnee National Forest, but I don't know if those ever took hold. Um, but again, rough grouse can serve as that umbrella species for a variety of young forest wildlife that we might be interested in. So we'll kind of talk about those top four, uh, maybe hit on some of the other ones as well, but really those, those top four are kind of the, the, the big ones in terms of forest game species. We have a few um, species that we may touch on just a little bit as far as forest adjacent or forest edge game species. So species you may um, see around the edges of your forest, things like morning dove, bobwhite, um, or cottontail, and the cottontail can obviously be in the forest as well. Um, but we won't cover as much on these, but if there are specific questions, I'd be happy to answer those at the end. So Adam uh, Jenke covered kind of that concept and idea of habitat really well, and that the idea of habitat is kind of where animals live and the resources that they need to survive and reproduce. And in general, habitat is made up of four components or elements, food, water, cover, and space are those. But I think the other important thing to talk about when we talk about habitat is that um, the idea that habitat is species or life stage specific. In general, uh, no two species are gonna have perfectly overlapping habitat. Um, they may, if you think of it as a Venn diagram, they may have some overlap, but not perfect overlap. And so the idea that what we would call white-tailed deer habitat isn't necessarily the same thing as oven bird habitat. Um, and so we need to be cognizant of, of this because even though I introduced the concept of umbrella species earlier, not all species are going to fit under that umbrella. And so if we make management decisions that are going to benefit deer or benefit turkey or other species, we may be making management decisions that have trade-offs for other species. Um, and, the, and the concept of this in the case of oven birds is that oven birds are uh, forest obligate species. They really like pretty um, open understories where there's not a lot of vegetation. They make their life in the leaf litter. Um, and so they don't like a lot of dense cover at the ground level in the understory, which maybe isn't the best for deer. Uh, but if we open up the canopy to improve it for uh, bedding or forage for deer, we may be uh, making it potentially worse for oven birds. And then there's the idea that um, the habitat is also life stage specific. So Different wild species have different habitat needs throughout their life history. In the case here, what a turkey may use to raise their brood or raise their young may look different from where a turkey would nest. So we need to think about how we can kind of provide those resources throughout the different life history uh, stages for wildlife species. So thinking this um, concept of habitat on a kind of a broad scale, if we use this drone image, aerial image here, we can look at and see how this, this landscape would provide food in the terms of maybe this food plot here would be a food resource for deer. Um, water, if they need freestanding water, they could find it here in this wetland. And then this forested area, this adjacent forested area, is going to provide both food and cover. And the circle um, would be analogous of the space, right? Different wildlife species are going to have different space needs. Some species like cottontail rabbits can live their entire life in three to five acres. Other species like uh, bobcats are going to have home ranges that uh, span multiple square miles um, or tens of square miles of area. And so just kind of drilling this concept a little bit farther um, in this idea that habitat is species and life stage specific. We take these two forests here. On the left, we have a closed canopy hardwood forest, mixed hardwoods uh, with very little understory, green understory here in the picture. That's pretty ideal habitat for oven birds because they really like that leaf litter to nest in and to find insects and find seeds and other resources. But once you open the canopy up and you start getting a pretty dense understory, which may be really good to hide turkey poults, and 
uh, provide a lot of insects for turkey poults. You may start to, to lose oven birds in this stand or at least have less oven birds in this stand because um, the resources that they need, that leaf litter is now interfered by that vegetation. So this gets the concept of, of while game species can serve as umbrella species, not all species habitat needs overlap and we need to think about what are some of those potential trade-offs we're going to have to make. So moving forward to some different habitat requirements for game species, white-tailed deer are pretty generalists. Um, they use a variety of different cover types and vegetation types, and that's why you see them all the way um, north into Canada, south into, into Florida and Texas, and west into um, the Great Plains. They can occupy a lot of different areas, and they seem to do pretty well in human modified environments. Um, and so we don't have to do a lot to have deer on the property. In fact, we probably really don't have to do anything to have deer on the property, but there are habitat management practices and management um, we can do in order to improve deer habitat quality, which then improves you know, deer condition, deer body weight, deer um, fawning rates. And then um, if we're interested in hunting, um, potentially antler quality and overall quality and size. So in general, um, deer like densely wooded vegetation as well as relatively tall early successional vegetation, things that you would find in like an old field, a shrubby area, um, kind of thickets, and then forests that have kind of a, a denser understory. They'll use mature closed canopy forests, especially as areas to travel through, potentially even bed in, and also um, foraging areas uh, when there's things like hard mass, like acorns available. They have a pretty wide range as far as food requirements. Um, the two kind of big ones that we'll talk a lot about are this kind of browse. So that is going to be woody vegetation and then um, forbs as well. And mostly they obtain their water from their diet, but they do use freestanding water when necessary and when it's available. And in general, their, their um, excuse me, home range or space requirements um, range in the neighborhood of about a, a square mile. It can be smaller, it can be larger, but in general, it's about a square mile. And a lot of that depends on how easy they can find the resources across their home range. So uh, this table here is, is a table of species of, um, or woody species that are commonly eaten by deer or what we call selected and then species that are commonly avoided by deer or highly avoided by deer, species that um, they don't really want to browse unless they're forced to, unless it's the only thing that they have to, to eat in the understory. And this is results of a research project that was going on um, in Indiana the past several years, and it looked at uh, a lot of things, but in general looked at deer use of the environment, deer use of, of wooded areas and how much deer are consuming woody plants and their impact they're having on the environment. And what was derived out of this was a lot of data, but this is a really good chart that kind of shows you what are some of those key species that deer are really looking for and are really after, and what are those species that um, are often avoided. And I think um, when we look at this list of highly selected species, we see some some things that aren't at least a surprise in my eyes is that a lot of times our oak species like black oak, um, white oak, and northern red oak, those are species that are highly selected by deer. And these are, these are browse on seedlings and saplings. So things that deer can reach anywhere from, uh, you know, right on the ground to about five, six feet off the ground. So they're really after a lot of those uh, oak species. Some other ones that are uh, really important from a deer perspective, greenbrier. Greenbrier is a common a species that is commonly consumed by deer across their range. You wouldn't think it because of all the thorns, but it's one that if you have greenbrier in your woods, it's a pretty good indication of how many deer you have because they, they will preferentially browse greenbrier over a lot of species. Some other ones here that are pretty common across the landscape, 
would be things like uh, sugar maple, red maple. Those maple species, especially when they're small, they can be good forage for deer. And then some of our shrub species are smaller tree species like gray dogwoods, flowering dogwoods, uh, wild strawberry bush. Those are all highly selected species. And we can go down the list and look, look at species that are, let me try to move this bar here. Species that are slightly selected, mean they'll, they'll eat them, but they're not, it's not going to be the first thing that they go to. Then you have species that were what are considered neutral, and those are species that they'll eat them if they need to, but they're not really out there seeking them. Um, and then we can go down all the way to our slightly avoided and highly avoided species. And I think the key here on the slightly avoided and slightly or highly avoided um, list is that if you look at a lot of those, a lot of those are our non-native invasive species that are common in woodlots. Things like wing burning bush, tartarian honeysuckle, um, amor honeysuckle, autumn olive, multiflora rose. Those are all species that are uh, invasive species. They are avoided by deer and not really commonly eaten unless, e eaten unless they are the only thing that's in the understory. And so if you have a wood lot that is choked out with honeysuckle, autumn olive, and multiflora rose, you're not going to have a lot of forage in there for things like white-tailed deer. The cover may be good, but you're not going to have a lot of things that the deer are going to want to eat. And so by removing those species and allowing other species to grow in that, their place, you can increase the quality of the browse in, in those areas. So moving on to turkeys, again, turkeys are pretty generalists. Um, they will occupy forests and environments, you know, through multiple ages. If they're older forests all the way to young forests, they're pretty general in their cover requirements. You'll find them in agricultural areas. Um, and so they're, they're pretty generalist. But they do like kind of young regenerating forests, brushy areas and old fields for nesting. So they kind of like that cover aspect of the, the shrubby or taller vegetation to hide their nests. They will also use uh, mature forests uh, or bushes openings in grain fields for foraging, so looking for insects and seeds. And they typically use those younger age forests in those in herbaceous areas like old fields or native grass fields for brood rearing. Um, and that's because they really like to have those poults hidden from predators. Um, but also be able to have the hen see above the vegetation to to look for any sort of danger. And of course, they're they're going to roost in trees and tall shrubs. They have a pretty varied food diet. It's going to vary seasonally. In the fall, they're uh, pretty reliant on hard mast things like acorns um, and beech nuts. Throughout the year, they'll also be consuming soft mast like uh, blackberries and um, other brambles, seeds, waste grain, leaves from forbs. Uh, oftentimes in the spring, you'll find species like clover in the crops of harvested turkeys where they've been in a clover field just eating the green vegetation. And they're going to eat insects throughout the year, and that's especially important um, to most birds during the brood rearing time period and the nesting time period because of the high protein and other resources that are needed for things like feather development. Um, they're going to obtain most of the water from their diet, but they're also going to use freestanding water when necessary and when available. And then their uh, space requirements can range anywhere from a little bit less than a square mile to multiple square miles. American woodcock is another one that we'll talk about. This is what is often considered a young forest specialist, meaning they really need dense stands of stems in order to um, for most of their life requirements. But because they they have different life history stages, that's not always true. For example, when they're in their courtship um, stage or when they're roosting in the spring and that, that courtship typically happens in the spring, they're actually looking for kind of openings with sparse cover, things like old fields or recently burned areas where they can uh, easily land and easily do their display um, and attract females. But other times of years, 
they are looking for kind of the young forest areas, areas two to 25 years old, hardwood stands or shrub cover, especially in moist areas where there's abundant um, worms for foraging. And they're going to use this for foraging, nesting, and brood rearing. And as they migrate through, they're going to be in these kind of dense thicket cover areas. They're uh, pretty reliant on invertebrates solely, and about 60% of their diet is actually earthworms. And most of their water is obtained from their diet. And they are migratory, but in the breeding season, they occupy in the neighborhood of about 150 acres. Uh, but through migration, they'll use a lot smaller areas uh, if the cover is, is right. Rough grouse is another kind of young forest specialist, although they have a, a little bit wider range of, of, um, of areas they'll use based on what they need. So in general, the age from about six to 20 year old forest stand, those young forests with really dense stems, um, those are gonna be used for a lot of uh, different needs that they have throughout their life history. Oftentimes they maintain pretty close proximity to mature forests and those mature forests are used um, for feeding on acorns and other mast. And they do use a variety of nest types and ages for uh, variety of forest types and ages for nesting. That brood rearing um, and kind of escape cover and other kind of general loafing cover is really that that dense stands um, where they have a lot of cover and potential food resources. They're going to consume buds, hard and soft mast insects and, and leaves of forbs uh, as well. Most of their, their water is obtained for the diet and their habitat requirements, their home range is generally in the neighborhood of 25 to 150 acres. The last one we'll talk about is Northern Bob White. Um, this is what I consider a grassland and shrubland specialist, meaning they need both grasslands and shrublands to, to meet their habitat requirements. So they use those shrubby areas or those thicket areas for escape and thermal regulation throughout the year. So escape heat and escape cold, but they also use old fields and open areas like native grass plantings or CRP fields with forbs and grasses for nesting and for brood rearing as well. And you won't often find uh, Bob White more than 100 to 150 yards from some sort of shrub cover. So they're really tied to the shrub cover a lot of times. They have a wide variety in their diet. The young quail, the broods are gonna be eating a lot of insects so that they have the extra protein and minerals needed to produce feathers and um, to grow. And the adults are gonna eat a variety of seeds, including legumes, ragweed seed, croton, lesbodeses, uh, the native lesbodeses, green vegetation, insects and invertebrates, waste grain, and then both hard and soft mast. So soft mast being things like berries, like blackberries. Most of their water is obtained through their diet and their habit, their home range requirements are generally about 25 to 100 acres, depending on the quality of the area. So that we have a better idea of some of the habitat requirements of these different wildlife species. We can talk about how forest age, succession and structure influence wildlife and influence wildlife habitat quality. So in general, where the light is, is where the food and cover is. Meaning if most of your light resources are uh, used up by the canopy, there's not a lot of light filtering to the ground level, it's generally gonna mean that there's not a lot of food or cover at the ground level, right? There's not a lot of plants in the understory because the light is being utilized by the canopy. So in closed canopy forest, most of the sunlight is going to the canopy in the mid-story. In more open canopy forests, like a woodland, um, sunlight is, is both in the canopy, but it's also hitting the forest floor, which then in turn allows plants to grow and a chance to thrive in the understory. So when we talk about wildlife habitat management, succession or the change in plant communities over time is a really important concept to understand, to understand how wildlife utilize the landscape and how we can manage it for certain wildlife species. And we can break up succession in kind of different phases. So if we were to take a, a bare crop field and stop farming it, um, what would happen to that field over 40 or 50 years? And this is gonna 
depend on you know what part of the state you're in and where you're located. But in general, it's going to go through these kind of five phases across um, most of the eastern U.S. We're going to have that old field stage where it's dominated by annual and perennial grasses and weeds. We're going to have this kind of mid successional stage, what I call the thicket stage, where you're starting to maybe lose some of those annuals, but where you're gaining are some of your more shrubby species like hawthorns, dogwoods, um, in this case, maybe some small cedars or some uh, pine trees or um, uh, things like plum. And then once you progress through that, you're going to get into these later successional stages, which are your forested stages. And that's going to your first stage, you're going to go through a, a big transition from kind of a young forest where it's pretty thick and dense to an older forest where it's um, pretty open and sparse. And that change in succession has a change in the resources that are available to wildlife species. And this is a chart that kind of shows how a young, how, how forest changes over time and then how the resources for wildlife species also changes. And so if we look at forage, for example, there's a lot of forage, I mean, there's a lot of green vegetation, plants, things like wildflowers and forbs. Those are those resources are pretty high during that early stages of succession when there's lots of grasses and forbs and maybe things like brambles. That really starts to dwindle once you get to a thicker, younger forest stage where you have a dense, uh, a dense amount of stems and you pick back up once you start to get in a mature forest and you start to get a little bit more canopy gaps. Browse is really the highest it's woody plants that are important for food resources really the highest in that younger forest stage where you have a lot of stems on the landscape and a lot of smaller stems that can be consumed. Same thing for cover. You have a lot of cover resources in those younger forest stages, especially at the ground level. And then once you get into older forest, you lose some of those those cover resources because um, there's not as much vegetation on the ground. Soft mass is also highest in those young forest stages, but you do get another pulse once you get more immature, more mature forests. Hard mass, oh, hard mass, which is kind of cut off here. Uh, you lose hard mass in the younger forest stages, things like acorns, and then you really start to pick up a lot of your hard mass species once you get into more mature forests. And then cavities and snags, so things that would be important to a variety of songbirds and woodpeckers and things like raccoons those really start to pick up as you get in those mature forest stages. So I think the, the takeaway from this chart is that you need a lot of different forest ages and forest stages to meet the requirements of a diversity of wildlife species. And just to kind of give you another visual re representation of how the forest structure can influence wildlife, and in, and in this case, game species, is that this is a, a common picture that you would see across, um, especially the central hardwoods, southern Indiana, southern Illinois, maybe even into other states, of a closed canopy forest that has a, a very sparse understory, a fairly dense midstory, meaning there's a lot of leaves and, and kind of mid-sized trees, and then a pretty dense canopy. And what we're seeing at the ground level is that um, we're only going to average about 50 to 100 pounds of deer forage per acre. And a deer on average needs about five to seven pounds of forage a day to survive. So we're not going to be able to feed many deer for very long um, with the amount of understory vegetation in here. Now, the benefit of the stand is that it has lots of oak trees and lots of hard mass producing species. So in the fall, if we have a good acorn crop, there'll be lots of of uh, mass resources in here. We compare that to another forest, and this is a forest that it has a more open kind of woodland like canopy and a very dense understory. And you can of a lot of different uh, herbaceous plants like forbs and wildflowers. And in this stand, you're going to have anywhere from two to 600 pounds of forage per acre. So we've forexed to um, 12 x the number of pounds of deer forage in this stand through management and management and reducing the canopy and also through prescribed fire. Taking this all the way to another extreme, this is a, a clear cut area. This is a, a about a five year old young forest. There is no canopy. 
and there's no understory, or sorry, there's, there's uh, no midstory, and the canopy and the understory are one thing, right? There's no distinction. These, the trees in here are growing up, and their leaves are only five to six feet off the ground. If we were to go out in this stand and measure how much deer forage we have, we'd have in the neighborhood of 500 to 1,000 pounds of deer forage per acre. Plus, we would have all kinds of thermal and fawning cover for deer, lots of nesting cover and brood rearing cover for things like turkeys as well. So that's just kind of three examples of how, the ch how three different forest structures can provide different resources for game species. Now, what I want to talk about is what I consider habitat management maxims or kind of rules of thumbs or things to consider. And one of those is that habitat management in its essence is managing succession. So managing how plant communities change over time by managing sunlight and plants. And so we're managing what plants get the sunlight, will get the sunlight and what plants occur um, on our site, either through different management practices like prescribed fire or through planting or other things. Habitat management is a decision. So we are deciding to um, use some sort of practice to alter the forest environment um, to benefit whatever species or, or needs that we see. All decisions have trade-offs. So one practice that may be uh, very good for game species like deer and turkey may not benefit all species. And uh, one of those practices would be things like prescribed fire. So very beneficial to a lot of wildlife species, but continual use of prescribed fire isn't necessarily the, the practice that's going to promote things like woodland salamanders because woodland salamanders need a very moist environment and um, and fire kind of creates a drier environment. And the way that we can come think about that as a, in a trade-off is that we utilize prescribed fire in areas that would have historically burned things like south facing slopes, west facing slopes, drier areas, and then um, don't burn on things like north facing slopes or east facing slopes where, excuse me, where they, there's more moisture and you'll find more um, woodland salamanders. And doing nothing is certainly an option. So kind of leaving the forest um, without our management is an option, but that's still a decision. And you're still um, favoring one set of species over another set of species. So in essence, managing wildlife, managing habitat, and that's managing plants. So um, we'll talk more about that, but I think boiling it down is, is what we're after is trying to manage the plant composition in the, in the plant structure in order to improve it for a variety of wildlife species. And kind of two um, guiding principles that I use when I think about managing a forest um, for game species or for wildlife in general are two really good quotes from Otto Leopold, who's uh, considered the father of wildlife management and uh, was an Iowa and, and Wisconsin resident. And that's the idea that a conservationist is one who is humbly aware that with each stroke of an ax, he is writing a signature on the face of the land. So every management practice that we use is a decision. And that decision is um, potentially changing the landscape and we're leaving our mark on the landscape. So we need to be kind of humbly aware of that fact that this, the decisions that we make today are going to influence things um, into the future. And then the second thing is that uh, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And so while we may be focused on game species and we may, fo may be focused on, species, on plant species that um, benefit those game species, we need to think about the value of all of the wildlife species in our woodlot and the value of all of the plants in our uh, woodlots and that we don't necessarily want to completely exclude certain plants or certain species out of a woodlot because they quote unquote don't have value for wildlife. The exception to that would be invasive species which um, have limited value for most wildlife species. So those are the kind of two guiding principles I use when I think about habitat management. And when we think about habitat management, some of the considerations we need to think of are what are our goals and objectives? So what species are we really interested in managing? Uh, what's the current condition of the habitat? 
what are the limiting factors? So limiting factors would be what are the resources that are most limiting to the species that we're interested in? And then also what are my or my property's limitations? And a good thing to think about there are, um, do I have the equipment necessary to complete a certain management action? Do I have the knowledge or training to use prescribed fire, for example? Um, a property limitation may be, you may be very interested in managing for bobwhite quail, but if you're in the middle of um, the Hoosier National Forest or the Shawnee National Forest, and your property is a wooded property surrounded by you know, square miles of other wooded properties, the probability you're gonna have quail on that site limited because the landscape limits it. Um, so you need to understand what, kind of, what are those, some of your limitations, your property limitation. And then those goals and objectives and the answer to those questions are going to drive your management actions or at least what the potential management actions are. And this slide here, I'm not gonna read it out loud, um, but you can take a look at it. This is kind of how that would play out, an example of how that may, may play out on a farm. And so in this example, the goal of this landowner is to improve habitat for northern bobwhite, but they also need to generate an income from the farm to you know, pay the mortgage, pay the taxes, whatever. And so the objectives might be in order to improve habitat for northern bobwhite, we need to improve brooding and nesting cover, but also improve woody cover. So the actions we may take to kind of meet those objectives of providing habitat, uh, but also generating income would be well, maybe we can enroll one of our farm fields in a program like the Conservation Reserve Program, which would provide habitat for wildlife, in this case, quail, but would also help us uh, generate an income off the property. And we'll go over some of these examples, more forested examples here in a minute. So when we think about managing our property, um, there's three kind of broad areas, and you could include one more in here as well, that, and that would be wetlands. Um, or water, but in general, lots of landowners are, are interested in focusing on the kind of these three things, food plots, fields, and forests. And most of the landowners that I work with, the first place they start is in this food plot side over here. And the reason that they start there, I think oftentimes is because it's a pretty uh, easy practice to get into. We all kind of have an agrarian background or at least uh, hopes of having a green thumb that we can plant something and that we're gonna benefit wildlife species by just through what we can plant. Um, and it's easy to make mistakes, right? If we make a mistake in a food plot, it's a, it's a mistake we can probably quickly fix in a year or two. Whereas if we make a mistake in our forest, that may have um, you know decades or longer implications. And so lots of times, Landowners start with food plots and then they start slowly progressing in their knowledge and experience and understanding and effort into fields and forests. But if you want to think about where you're going to have the most most impact on the wildlife species that you have on your property, you need to take a look at um, what your property makeup and landscape is. So here's an example of a property in Indiana. In general, this property makeup is about 80% forested, 15% fields, and 5% food plots. And you know, there's some wetlands and, and streams on there as well. Um, in general, I would say a lot of landowners spend about 50% or more of their time on this on food plots here. And in this case of this landowner, they were spending at least 50% of their time on food plots, but that only makes up 5% of their property. They weren't really doing anything in their forest yet. They were doing a little bit of stuff in their fields, but looking to really change the landscape on your, on your property and impact wildlife in the, in, the way, in the best way possible or have the biggest bane for your buck, you need to think about what is the predominant cover type on my property, in this case, forests, and what are some ways that I can start managing that large 80% um, and improving it for wildlife. And that doesn't mean managing it all at one time, but start thinking about what are some areas on the farm that I can, I can manage in the forest that are gonna have the greatest impact. So the biggest bang for your buck on this property would be managing your forest and also managing your fields. And you can create food 
through managing these forests and fields and not even really think about food plots. Food plots are great, but they should be considered a supplement to other habitat management that's going on on your property. So we're going to kind of really focus on that forest side of it. How can we manage those forests for game species or, or wildlife in general? And we're going to manage our forest composition, so the forest plant composition, through the structure um, and, and structure through sunlight. So manipulating what parts of the forest get the sunlight. And in general, forest structural diversity is equal to wildlife diversity or gets you wildlife diversity. And we can go back to that chart earlier that kind of showed the different pulses of resources across different forest ages and stages. And our management must match the habitat requirements and address the limiting factors of the species we're interested in. So in general, our management options can kind of be boiled down into um, a few kind of categories. One would be regenerating the stand, meaning this is we're going to use something like a timber harvest to kind of create the next stage of forest. Um, we can think about improving the stand, meaning we can use tools such as forest stand improvement. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute to improve the quality of the stand. We can leave the stand, meaning we can kind of do no management, or we can clear the stand and change the vegetation type into kind of uh, maybe early successional vegetation or an old field or a forest opening. We're going to kind of talk about these two here, regenerating the stand and improving the stand. So forest regeneration is uh, one of the ways that we can manage our forest for wildlife. And we can do that through timber harvest and we can do that through different types of forest regeneration methods or different types of timber harvest. We have what we call even age forest regeneration, which means we are um, managing a forest that is kind of all one age class, and that's done through shelter woods and clear cuts. Then we have uneven age regeneration, which is typically done through single tree selection or group selection. We'll talk more about those. And then we have ways that we can improve the forest using a variety of different management tools. We're going to skip that slide because it, uh, it wasn't working earlier. But when we think about timber harvest considerations for wildlife, there's often the, the thought that timber harvest and wildlife are not compatible. Um, in many cases, timber harvest and wildlife can be compatible. And in fact, timber harvest can be beneficial to a variety of different wildlife species. Some things to consider with timber harvest is that you need to think about controlling invasives before you harvest. So things like uh, multiple rows and bush honeysuckle are going to be much easier to control before you harvest the stand than they will be after. Um, if we're managing timber and using timber harvest for wildlife, we want to think about keeping hard and soft mass producing trees, things like oaks, hickories, black gum, persimmon. We don't have to keep all of them, but we want to favor those species. Um, we also want to think about keeping snags or living cavity trees. Um, especially if we're interested in some non-game species like bats and, and songbirds and uh, woodpeckers. And then the best methods to use timber harvest on your property are going to depend on your property and your focal species, right? The size of the harvest, the equipment used, the techniques used are all going to be dependent on your property and then also your, your focal species and objectives. And when thinking about using timber harvest for wildlife, it's always good to consult both a forester and biologist because Oftentimes, they're going to, going to approach timber harvest from different perspectives, and it's good to kind of have um, those per different perspectives when you're considering this type of management. And the nice thing about timber harvest from a wildlife standpoint is that timber harvest can pay for a lot of the other wildlife management or forest stand improvement that, that you would like to do on the property. Some of our forest stand improvement practices we'll talk about, their cost there are costly practices and there's cost share available to help cover the cost, but timber harvest can help offset some of the costs of other practices you might use on the property. So first we'll talk about no harvest, so not harvesting. In general, this is going to have limited browse and limited cover for species like deer and turkey. You'll still maintain the roost sites, which will be important for turkeys. And you would still be maintaining the hard mast if it's 
already pre if it's already available and present. So this can be beneficial for things like uh, squirrels, mature for songbirds, bats, woodland salamanders are going to benefit from um, leaving a stand as a closed canopy stand. And turkey and deer will use these stands, but they're not going to be optimized for those species. So this is a typical um, closed canopy stand here in Indiana that has kind of a limited under understory, not a lot of food and cover available, especially when you get into the winter when you lose most of this, this uh, leaf cover. Single tree selection is um, a practice where we just kind of remove single trees throughout the stand. And that's going to result in a little bit of an increase in deer forage. So 75 pounds, 125 pounds an acre. You're still going to have that limited cover um, for deer and turkey, depending on how many trees you remove from the stand. So the more trees you remove from the stand, the more cover, the more sunlight reaches the ground level, and the more cover you're going to have for deer and turkey. You're still going to have root sites available and hard mass is still going to be available if it's present and if you're leaving those trees. And this can also be beneficial for a variety of, of uh, game and non-game species. So here's a, what a site would look like after a single tree selection. Here's our single tree that was removed, the canopy gap that was created because of it. Group selection is another tool, and that's often referred to as a patch cut or regeneration openings, um, depending on where you are and the, the lingo that's used. But these can actually create a fair amount of deer forage because they create kind of bigger openings in the canopy, which allows more sunlight throughout the day to reach the ground level. And that's going to increase the amount of forage, increase the amount of browse, increase the amount of soft mast. So you're going to have lots of blackberries, lots of brambles inside these openings. which is also going to increase cover for deer fawning, escape, and thermal color, cover and increase nesting and brooding cover for wildlife for uh, wild turkeys. These practices can also benefit um, some of our young forest wildlife species like rough grouse and American woodcock, whippoorwills, which is uh, a species that's been declining, um, benefit from these practices, and so do species like bats because they will preferentially forage over some of these openings. And so this is a, what a drone shot or an overhead view of a, of a group selection or a patch cut may look like. This site here is probably in the neighborhood of about two acres. Group selection harvest can be anywhere from a quarter acre up to multiple acres. But you can see here that we still have most of the mature forest around this patch cut. So we're still getting the resources from the mature forest and that's adjacent to this kind of opening. Here's what a ground level look would look like in a group selection opening. And we see there's lots of vegetation, lots of cover, lots of food resources for wildlife. Uh, another tool would be something like a shelter wood. So shelter wood is um, uh, a technique where you kind of, you almost mix single tree selection and group selection where you kind of remove species and trees preferentially from throughout the stand to kind of create intermediate light reaching the ground level. And then you're favoring and leaving mass producing tree species like oaks and hickories. This can produce several hundred pounds of forage per acre, lots of forage, browse, soft mast, increased cover, um, the benefits you'd get from a group selection. But the other benefit is that you're, you're retaining hard mast producing tree species in the overstory. So beneficial to a variety of wildlife species. One of my favorite ways to manage forest for, for a diversity of wildlife. And this is an example of, of a, a shelter wood harvest where we have intermediate light reaching the ground level, still some shade, lots of big oak trees still present in the stand, but lots of cover on the ground level <coughs> to benefit uh, a variety of wildlife species. Clear cut is another tool we can use. It's an even age tool. We can produce a lot of food and a lot of deer forage and a lot of cover through a clear cut, but we are gonna lose those mass producing species for at least 20 to 30 years before they come back in the stand. And it can be beneficial for a lot of our young forest wildlife species, <coughs> such as grouse and woodcock and young forest songbirds and even bobcats um, who are going to be in there utilizing all the small mammals and eating the small mammals that are in there. This is a, a picture from an intern uh, that I had that was walking through about a six year old clear cut. And you can see 
just the amount of blackberry and soft mast and vegetation this site just to go show you all the food and all the cover that can be available in a, in a clear cut area. And in general, the difference between a clear cut and a group selection is that clear cuts tend to be bigger, multiple acres in size up to you know, 10, 20, 30 acres in size. So the other um, way that we think about managing forest for game species or wildlife is through forest stand improvement. And in general, the objective with forest stand improvement is that we're going to improve the quality of the stand or the forest stand for wildlife or some other objective. And it's not always the same as timber stand improvement um, because we're not necessarily cons as concerned about the quality of timber if wildlife is our, is our primary objective. So we're going to think about practices that are going to impact wildlife more than necessary timber quality. So some things to consider are, are similar to timber harvest that we need to think about keeping soft and hard mass trees, um, keeping snags and living cavity trees for a lot of our non-gain species, and that in general, forest and improvement practices are the ones that are going to cost us money and time, um, but we can pay for these through uh, income derived from timber harvest or through cost share programs like environmental quality incentive programs or others. So some of the Different forest stand improvement practices we could use would be things like invasive species control. So by removing these species, which I already showed you earlier, are of limited uh, food value for at least deer, we can create better resources in our in our forests. And I wish I had a before picture of this stand, but this is a stand um, near campus at Purdue where this entire understory was nothing but bush honeysuckle until we went in with a, what's called a forestry mulcher, which is a rotating head on, a, on front of a bobcat and basically mulched all of the honeysuckle, sprayed the re-sprouts, and this is all the vegetation that came back, uh, which is of much higher quality to game species, to pollinators, to non-game species than it was before. Another tool that we can use from forest improvement is what's called crop tree release. And that's where we take um, crop trees, in this case, oaks, um, trees that are good mass producers, and we give them more room in their canopies to grow. And by allowing them more room to grow, their canopies get bigger, and they, thus they produce more acorns and more food for, for wildlife. And then in this open area around the trees that we've released, or that we've opened the canopy up, we're also getting a variety of understory plants and vegetation in here um, that's going to provide food and cover. And just to kind of show you some data from a research project we did at the University of Tennessee when I was down there, is that we looked at how that crown releasing, but also how fertilization impacts acorn production. What we found was that on average, by crown releasing a white oak tree, we're able to increase the acorn production by 65%. And really fertilization did nothing. So we didn't gain any benefits from fertilizing trees. We gained all the benefits from giving the crown of those oak trees more space to grow. So there's another technique that we can use, what's called a wildlife improvement cut. And that's a way that, um, or wildlife retention cut, where we can selectively remove trees and, and certain tree species that are of lesser value to wildlife and favor our mass producing trees, which increases forage, browse, and soft mass, but also diversifies the stand structure. And here's an example of a, a site in Southern Indiana where we did this. And what we did in here is that we actually went through and we girdled these beaches and sprayed them with herbicide to create these gaps in the canopy to allow more sunlight to reach the ground. And we favored some of the oak trees that were in this stand and left the oak in, in hickories. And we did this and we went back uh, a couple summers later to kind of check and see the results. And as we were walking through this stand, we ran across uh, not only this fawn, but other wildlife species as well. But these can be really good bedding areas and really good fawning cover and food resources for wildlife. Another tool that we have is prescribed fire. And this is a tool that does a lot, can do a lot of things, both from a forestry and a wildlife perspective. It increased forage, browse, and soft mast. It helps thin our midstone, which allows more sunlight to reach ground level. We can create snags with it. 
We can promote some of our mass producing species like oaks and hickories, and it's beneficial to a variety of different wildlife species. This is a stand in Southern Indiana where we did one prescribed fire. We did the prescribed fire in March, and then this picture was taken in June. And you can see all of the new oak sprouts, white oak and red oak, and all the vegetation that re-sprouted just a few months after the fire. So fire can be a really good way to, to manage uh, a lot of our, especially our oak hickory forests. So I know I'm running short on time, but one of the one of the things that I wanted to do now is kind of walk you through a case study of where we've applied some of these tools to some stands on some of our research properties and kind of looked at how things changed over time. So this is a picture of, of one of the forests on one of our research properties near Purdue's campus. Um, and this is a picture taken the same day of another stand on the same property. And if uh, that first picture was actually taken from a stand up on top of this hill up here where we hadn't done any management, and this next picture is a picture that we took of a site where we have done invasive species control and one prescribed fire. So we went in here with um, brush saws and axes and removed things like bush honeysuckle and winged burning bush. So that, that's what the site looked like in 2016. Here's what that same site looked like in 2020. And the, the additions that we did from 2016 to 2020 were that we did two, we did another prescribed fire and we did a shelterwood harvest where we removed a lot of those smaller mid-story uh, maple trees like these you see here and this one in the foreground. A lot of those are, have been removed and we um, opened up the canopy a little bit. And you can see all the vegetation that's responded um, inside of this stand that's providing good cover food and cover resources. Uh, sorry for the blurry picture. But that's what that same site looked like in 2021. And I circled this 14 here. This is a tree that we've keep, we keep track of for some inventory plots, but you'll see it in the next subsequent pictures as well. So we kind of let that progress for a couple of years. In 2022, you can see that tree 14 is kind of, you can't see the 14 anymore because of the woody regeneration in here. And so we were interested in getting some of our, our uh, forbs and broadleaf plants back. So November of 2022, we did a prescribed fire on this site. This is what that site looked like uh, a couple of days after the burn. This is what that site looked like in April of 2023. Here's that uh, 14 again. So the same tree, lots of spring ephemerals in April before the canopy closes. And then here's what that site looked like this summer. Um, lots of blackberry, lots of of uh, forbs, some woody plants, but we're kind of starting to bring it back down a little bit shorter to where we can benefit some of our species like uh, wild turkey. And we'll continue to burn this site. And if I went out there and measured how much deer forage was out there, we'd be in the neighborhood of uh, probably three to 600 pounds of deer forage. So just a few things to wrap up, a few kind of tips and things to think about putting it all together is that there's lots of options to benefit game species, both from a timber harvest to a forest and improvements perspective. But in general, forest management is managing sunlight and managing plants. So we're, we're making choices and decisions about where that sunlight's going. Is it going to the canopy? Is it going to the understory? And we must match our kind of management to the species habitat requirements and the existing forest condition. And two kind of last pieces of advice from a landowner perspective is consult with a forester and biologist, you know, build your habitat team, have them kind of help provide you guidance so you get multiple perspectives. So that way you can um, do practices like timber harvest that maybe are going to gain you some uh, income, but also do them in a way that's going to benefit wildlife species. And then also start small, right? If you, if 80% of your property is forested and you have 100 acres, that's 80 acres, you don't have to treat and manage all 100 acres all 80 acres at one time, you can start small with small practices and then build towards kind of bigger and larger projects. So I think I, I ran over time a little bit, but um, there's some additional resources that are beneficial for folks to check out. We have several publications from Purdue related to um, kind of forest management for wildlife. There's also a really good one from the University of Tennessee, all about forest stand improvement for wildlife. And then if you're more of a podcast person, 
Uh, we have several podcasts which are part of this Natural Resources University that are related to habitat management, Habitat University, which is one myself and Adam Jenke lead, and then Deer University and Wild Turkey Science are all related to uh, management for game species. So I apologize for going over a little bit, but if folks are willing to stay on, I still have some time. I'd be happy to answer questions.